Have you ever had any close calls? <laughs> a few. Got me one day, I was trying to get them in the corral and the gate swung too far. What's going on guys? We are on our way down to Southwest Missouri. We're gonna visit a ranch called Hillside Bison. You're not gonna wanna miss this episode. We'll see you there. two different herds then? Um, it's easier to, you can kind of keep your own offspring and switch them in between them. To try to get the best of everything. Sure. So how many bulls are you running then? Uh, we have five bulls we're basically running between the two herds. We have three bulls in our bigger herd and then uh, we have two bulls in our, our other, our small herd. So how many animals are right here? Uh, 33. We had a, a late crop last year of around uh, late September, October of around eight. And then we had uh, 12 out of this this year. Last year we had a lot more heifers. And I think this year we have a lot more bulls. Very rarely have we ever gotten like 50% of each. Really? Yeah, one year's always slided more to the other. Really? No rhyme or reason? No. Uh, I'm Daniel Bonencamp. It's my wife, Nancy. Uh, we. We raised bison. We're third generation. My grandpa started um, early 80s. My parents had a, a late 80s, so when we got our first farm, uh, there was no, really no question. We were having bison too. Yeah. Uh, and that, we got our first ones in 2011, and we've been growing them ever since. So why bison? Like why, why this and not cows? Well, I think bison's less work. Uh, they're more majestic, just better to look at. I think they're actually more more intelligent. They're smarter animals. Yeah. Once you once you start and kind of get into them, there's no question why. You just that's just the way it is. So I always have my guard on. They always have theirs on. Uh, they're a wild animal. Always will be. Doesn't even matter if you can hand feed them. One day they can they can come after you. Um, and just how self sufficient they are. They, they 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 pretty much take care of themselves for the most part. Um, and that's that's something I really like. Don't have to babysit them all the time, worrying about them, especially during calving. You don't have to worry about if they're going to need one pulled. They just take care of it all on their own. We try to just give them whatever pasture they, they want and then oh, free choice minerals. Um, during the summer months, we've ha having to supplement them a little bit. Our fields aren't exactly where we want them yet on the, this new farm. Um, we try not to do that too much. When we do get our corrals built, we'll be giving them treats I guess I call it once a week or so in there just so they get used to coming in the corrals but for the most part we try not to to supplement them we got a little over 340 acres 54 head of bison right now uh, plus the calves of course we haven't counted those yet our numbers aren't quite what our land is, can hold so we're working at getting more fencing put up so we can get more animals we hope to expand out to about 100 head out here so are these uh, are these plains or woods bison I haven't had them tested I believe they're mostly plains uh, like I said, a lot of them, uh, some of them, uh, my dad actually has got a herd too, just on the other side of Mountain Grove. Okay. Uh, and some of them we got from him. Uh, some, a lot of them we bought through the association sales. Like I said, we haven't had them all tested, but they primarily look plains anyway. So how long, uh, how long have you guys had this herd right here? We started it in 2011. And I think we have only one left that was from the original. Every, everybody else has gotten too old or had to be moved on. Say we have 60, 70 acres of woods. Really? Everything else is open. Okay. And even the woods aren't like heavy. It's pretty easy to, to walk through, drive through. Really? I assume not very much forage in the woods for them. You know, bison are interesting creatures. They will eat things you would never suspect. Uh, our last farm was about 50% woods and 50% open, so we had a lot more trees and stuff. And these bison, they they thrived. I didn't have to feed. I didn't have to do as much feeding as I am now, and they were on a lot less ground. Really? Um, but I think there's there's for, they foraged in the woods. They'd eat leaves. They'd eat brush. I don't know all they ate. Uh, I did do that. What your bison eat one year study that. Can't remember who it was put on. It was six months. You went out taking stool samples, and the 
the, the results I got back from that was kind of eye-opening. The stuff that they were eating wasn't anything that I'd ever seen in the fields. Really? Yeah. So you start looking back on, the, they'd give you the, whatever the, the scientific name of what the forage was they were eating, and you go look it up, and you had never seen it before. Do you guys feed minerals to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use uh, a Neutrina product, the uh, emerald. comes in emerald for when the grass is growing, and then I think it's bronze in the fall and winter. Okay. Seems to, we just leave it out, pour it out in a, a trough or tub, and they'll just eat whatever they want out of it. I let them pick and choose. I mean, they, they're going to know best what they want. They'll always seem to figure out what they want, and they'll, they'll get it. How did you guys get started in this? Was it a uh, mutual agreement, or did somebody pull somebody's leg? Well, Daniel is actually third generation. His okay. grandpa started in the early 80s, and they're in Seymour, right along 60. And then Daniel's parents, they started in the late 80s. So bison's all Daniel ever knew. So whenever we got our farm, it wasn't really a question of if we would have bison or cows. It was just we were going to have them. <laughs> so. But I remember growing up, we didn't go to the same school. I remember driving by their house and seeing the bison when I was young. So it's kind of interesting that we ended up getting together and they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it said that once it's in your blood, you can't get it out. I, I believe it. Um, these animals are so much smarter. They are. They're just so much smarter and more intelligent than I think anybody ever gives them credit for. And they're so much, so much more majestic to see a herd of bison walking out there than it is a herd of cattle. It's definitely an adventure. We've learned a lot over the years and made a lot of mistakes, but we've learned a lot. So. And we've ne we'll never stop learning. That's I think it's the most important thing. Don't ever stop learning. There's always something, a new way, a new approach, something new to, to try. And everybody that has bison is so knowledgeable, and they're mm -hmm. so willing to share their knowledge. That's the best part about, like, the Missouri Bison Association or the National Bison Association. Everybody's just so willing to share what they've learned. How many times a year do you work them? Uh, we try just twice, once in the fall and once in the spring. So... We bison kind of eat close to the ground, and there's a, a heavy parasite load in this part of the country. So we got to make sure we're always giving them uh, anti-parasitics, if I can get that word right. Um, so we try to do that twice a year. Once in the spring, kind of uh, when the grass is starting to grow really green, and then once in the fall, we'll try to get all the calves off and wean them and do the same thing. Okay. Do you mess with uh, vaccinations very much? Uh, just the twice a year. Unless there's someone that just absolutely needs it, we try not to, to mess with them. And by the time you see a bison is sick, it's almost too late to do anything about it by the time they start really showing signs. So it's a lot of, a lot more about pre preventative? Yes, it's a lot more. Do you uh, ever consider dehorning them to make them less dangerous? Uh, no, that changes them. They're, they're not the same then. How so? Um, I'm going to say horns give them an attitude, and that attitude is what makes a bison. It just really is. You dehorn them, um, they just don't have the the same attitude. They're they're a completely different animal. Um, and I just we've had a few over the years. Um, we've had some that's broken off both horns, and they're just they're just not the same. A few years ago, we started having serious problems with flies, um, just taking over the animals. And we we've tried a few different things over the years, uh, getting them in the corrals and just actually spraying them, spraying them all. And we learned that's just it's a little too dangerous for them. They get running around, they'll run into each other, hurt each other. Um, so now we've tried the, the back rubbers, and they seem to work out pretty good for us. If we put something that they want, like a, a mineral, on the other side of it, they'll, they'll usually rub on them. Uh, this year we tried introducing some garlic to them, and I think between the combination of those things, it's, been, it's probably been our best fly year we've ever had. Really? Yeah. Or I guess lack of flies. Yeah, right. Do you feed hay in the winter? Yes, we do. We try not to get fescue hay, and that's primarily what's here. We try to get something a little bit, what we call higher quality, a little bit better for them. Um, seems to work out better for us. Uh, bison are designed to lose 15 to 20 percent of their body mass during the winter, and then they come back in the spring and, and gain it all back. Uh, we're trying to maybe slow down that loss a little bit. So higher, higher protein mainly? Yeah.
So you said uh, you had two herds. Is yes. this your main herd here? This, this is our big herd, yes. And uh, why don't you run um, them all together? So we, our second herd, we started buying some other genetics from um, out of the area. We're trying to, I guess, Missouri and I, some other genetics, uh, some more award-winning uh, farms. You know, it's always the name of the game is how fast can you get an animal from, from birth to, you know, uh, butcher weight. Or, you know, even your calves, you, you want them to be uh, bigger bodied calves. Um, so in order to do that, some people are just, you can feed them, just push, uh, you know, grain and other, other feed to them. And we want to be more grass fed. So how fast can we get a grass fed animal up to our, our butcher weight size? And, you know, that always starts with how big the calf is when you, you wean them and how fast they can grow. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for, to get something marketable quicker. We do. We sell meat. Uh, we sell it to a local uh, health food store. We have a grocery store um, in Springfield, and we have another meat store down on the, the Theodosia Lake. We have a restaurant in Springfield, too, that sells our meat. Uh, not online. Uh, we will sell it off the farm also. So we just have five strand barbed wire, six foot T posts. Uh, we've learned over the years it doesn't matter. Uh, my dad started with uh, seven foot T posts and you had six strands of barbed wire. Our other farms we did six and a half foot T posts, still five strands. Um, we've tried hot wire. Uh, we figured out if they want to go through it, they're going to go. So we just make sure that they're always happy on their side of the fence and they they don't seem to push the fence. They don't lean on it or try to stick their head through near as much as what cattle would. Um, but if they want to go through, they're just they're just going to go. Do you have very much issue with them getting out? Uh, no. Uh, we moved here and we've been dealing with a few fencing issues. Um, and the fencing just, I guess, wasn't quite up to what we needed it to be. So we've been fixing fixing fence and putting, putting gates up, putting lots of gates, uh, wire gates. We have found. These animals just love to go through. So we've been having to replace a lot of those with uh, pipe gates. But you always learn the hard way. You, the bison will show you whatever weakness you have. <laughs> I remember as a kid, um, in my dad's corral, we would have a, a few panels. We had the old cable schools. We'd get a tractor in and try to make a lane. And those buffalo, they'd jump the tractor, belly crawl underneath it. I mean, it was, it was a rodeo back then. And all we had back then was a a cattle head shoot, a self-catch cattle head shoot with a homemade crash gate, how no one ever got hurt or seriously injured, I, I don't know. It was, it was a rodeo. I'm surprised they kept wanting to do it year after year. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it was, was. It was that much of an adventure. It was, it was an adventure. And I've got friends that I had convinced to help me once, and after that they didn't want to help me anymore. <laughs> so, so what do you have going on here? Um, this will be my corrals once I get them built uh, we'll probably bring them in here and these will be a, a big main pin uh, we might when we get them all in here all uh, 50 some head out of that herd the big herd we'll probably let them run all the way down and then run them back in and then we'll just be able to run them into these little alleys that are already set here this was already here I just got to make it taller and stronger and then we'll put our squeeze chute over there at the where the cows used to walk in from the dairy barn We'll build a, a quarter tub and have a, a way to, to kind of squeeze them in. Uh, I built a quarter tub at my last farm and it seemed to work pretty decent. Uh, you work with bison long enough and they love to go back to where they came from. They, they will every time. You close the gate, they'll put their nose at the chain side. Um, it's kind of amazing. So if you can, you can watch them for a while and learn some about their, their habits and what they do, you can kind of build things at where they want to go. Um, but yeah, get them in the, in the big pen and then you can kind of push them where you want as long as everything's big enough and strong enough. And like I said, we'll get them all up here and walk them into these, these two pins that I have. And then we'll go across the little drive there and have a few more pins so we can keep narrowing them down, get them in smaller and smaller groups. Are you doing all the welding yourself or yeah. are you having it done? You know, I, <laughs> me and a friend. Yeah? Yeah. A lot of late nights? It, yeah, late, well, yeah no lights so all all weekends and days so yeah there'll be a lot of, a lot of work a lot of this was here already we just got to add the extensions but we've built the last two ourselves it's just it's a lot of work uh how many animals do you think this facility is going to be able to hold um when so 
we'll do this to begin with and then we'll end up building some pins out there and pins going up that way and we'll end up probably 150 to 200 head with calves and everything and be able to have the the pins to separate them all out make okay. it safe that way you can work them and still be able to dump them back into a pin if you want to load them out okay um, always have lots of options you can never have enough gates and enough pins you just we've learned that over the years and when you try to build enough you're always one short right is that your uh, other herd yes it is right out there yep and how many animals are in there uh 15 adults and a few adolescents okay and is that the uh basically the higher quality what you're trying to shoot for yeah with those the, guys the better genetics really uh, more of the award-winning genetics now i say that but that's you know award-winning for up north and the national you get in missouri because it's completely different weather right uh the animals do not grow the same uh, i had read once so every centigrade it's warmer is worth 25 pound loss really so if we're 10 centigrades warmer here than they are way up north that's 250 pounds difference right that's a big deal that, that's a that's a real big deal so it's harder for us to get some animals up to weight you know everybody else can get uh, if you go to the the gold trophy show you'll see 18 1900 pound two-year-olds uh, obviously we're not doing that here sure but we're trying to find what combination of genetics we can kind of mix together to make a Missouri breed that does well. I've heard of that with uh, white-tailed deer that uh, the northern nor northern areas have bigger bucks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yep. That's interesting. So and it's the other interesting there was a some studies done is the climate's warming up the, the world's warming up you know everything's five degrees warmer so now the animals are actually getting smaller up north because they're warmer. Well what does that entail for us? <laughs> Even smaller. Yeah <laughs> so you know, we're, I guess that's one of our goals is to see how we can get the the best quality and biggest animal on the grass. We don't want to be feeding them every day. That's not what these animals were designed for. So that's sure. kind of what we're trying to, to mix, find different breeding stocks from different parts and put them together. Sure. Uh, we'll get them all coming into this bottom gate. What we'll end up doing is after we get it built, we'll uh, give them some treats in here, some candy, some, some grain. Uh, get them in here for a few days or a few times. It might be over a period of a month. Uh, they come in here and they'll be our, our crowds and they get used to coming in here and we'll just shut a gate behind them and then we'll chase them all into this big area here around us and then because they like going into the bottom we'll have the other gate open so when they get down to the bottom they'll go left instead of right and then we can fill up a pin that kind of lane there and then the next lane over and then we can after we get them in there we can start getting the smaller groups to go across uh, there's two other lanes over there it'll be our, our tub and our squeeze chute and our alleys going all up the back of that dairy barn i've got some old drill stem two and seven eighths drill stem that i'm adding the extensions with i've got a bunch of inch and a quarter 11 gauge or inch and a half 11 gauge steel uh, square tubing that'll go the sides of it i'll put about eight rows it'll be seven foot tall i tried six they could still they still try to jump too much i tried six and a half they still try to jump too much Seven seems to be a, a decent working height where they don't try to jump as much. Do they jump or do they climb? They jump. They, I mean, if they get their foot stuck on a bar, they might try to jump off of it again, but they, they just jump. Yeah. If do they you, think. Do, does one jump more than the other, like the bulls? Do they jump more than the... Uh, I think the cows ever? get crazier than the bulls. The cows do? Yeah. Really? Especially the older ones, I think, I guess, because we keep them longer. They get older and they just get more temperamental. Uh, the bulls, we try not to keep them as long as we do the cows, try to change them out to get new bloodlines running. And this area is a, a big beef producing area. And our kids, I don't, I don't know that what they would know what to do with beef. They actually asked one time, why can't we just have cows? Cows are really neat. And I'm like, the bison are cooler. What is wrong with you? But it's all they've ever had. So they're like, it's just a buffalo. Why can't we have a cow? <laughs> Grass is always greener. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but they help a lot. They mm -hmm. they do a lot. When it's working time, they're running the gates. And when we get yeah. in the corral, they run gates and get shots ready. And in our corral systems, like I said, we had just moved to this farm. So we don't have them built yet, but we try to build them. So who's ever working them is never really right next to them. Uh, we always try to have a safety zones or there's a fence or something between you and the bison because they're so unpredictable. A month, month and a half ago when they were in pretty heavy rut, the bulls were kind of fighting with each other and then things get a little a little more dangerous, but they've settled down quite a bit. Yeah. Have you ever had any close calls? <laughs> a few. 
Yeah. Yeah. We tried to uh, get rid of those genetics. <laughs> we had a bull. Uh, it was on our other herd, and we actually bought him at the association sale. We were looking kind of a gap fill. We had bought uh, one bull from Gerald Parsons, but he was too young to service the herd, so we bought one at the association. Um, and he was a, a nice looking bull, pretty good size, and he just had a, I'm going to call it an ornery streak. Um, he, he got me one day, I was trying to get him in the corral, and the gate swung too far, and he got me, and the only thing was, he didn't get me, but the only thing between me and him was an inch and a half bar. And he was walking me around that bar. That'll get your adrenaline pumping. Yes. He was a little bit honorier than what we like. He, did, he probably didn't stay very long. No. Longer than we probably wanted him to. So we try to make sure that whatever animals we keep are pretty common docile. Um, that you won't have to worry too much about in the field. They're not really going to chase you. They're not going to try to cause you harm. Now, once you lock the gate, everything, you know, all bets are off. You get them in a corral, it's, yeah, every, everybody goes crazy. Appreciate you guys watching. Uh, thank you to Daniel and Nancy uh, at Hillside Bison yes. for uh, showing us your awesome ranch and the buffalo. It's been really cool to see these animals and see the uh, condition they're in, the really good condition, really cool farm. Uh, this Missouri spot is just amazing. Uh, rolling hills, tall trees, it's just really, really cool. So thank you guys for watching. My name is Noah Gordon. We are Broken Arrow Bison, and we will see you next time.